Welcome to the online video series from 3CX. My name is Nicholas and I'll be your trainer for today. Today we are going to see the security and anti-fraud mechanisms of 3CX. In this module, we will, we will see the vulnerabilities which are available as VoIP attacks and hacks, and we will see how 3CX will countermeasure these fraud attempts. We will see the various security options of the PBX, and we will talk about how to maximize the security of the PBX. We will see how the PBX will protect itself against fraudulent actions based on a set of rules and thresholds which can be configured in 3CX. We will see how these uh, interact with each other, how they are configured and how they impact the performance of the PBX as well. Now there are various types of VoIP attacks and hacks out there. Most of them are not from the outside world. Sometimes an attack may be from the inside as well. For example, listening to VoIP calls will sometimes be, for example, done from the internal network and not from outside. Uh, brute force attacks, for example, are from the outside. Someone will try to guess their way into the network, for example, by trying to figure out the extension numbering, uh, usernames, and passwords. Denial of service will basically prevent the rightful owner from using their resources. This may be either an invite flood where you send uh, bogus requests to the PBX or even just dialing the PBX and filling up all these simultaneous calls uh, intentionally uh, while preventing from the rightful people from using their PBX. That is also a denial of service attack. Dictionary attacks where people will try to guess the password. So if you do have a very easy password, it will be very easy to breach. Now, HTTP attacks and hacks where people will try to attack the PBX via the uh, web server you will have brute force trying to enter the management console and to use the RPS uh, as a backdoor into the PBX. We will also see later on some man in the middle attacks. Now the extension security is one of the main points of entry into the PBX. Uh, people will try to guess their way as an extension into the PBX. Uh, for example, the authentication details which the PBX will have as a countermeasure. Uh, we have now made the SIP ID into a random alphanumeric SIP ID now. It's not the same as the extension number. So you will have the extension number being different to the SIP ID and the password will remain a seven character long alphanumeric lowercase uh, string. You can secure the password further by adding more characters, up to 50 characters, and also adding uh, uppercase as well to further the complexity of the password. The voicemail may also be considered as a point of entry into the PBX. Uh, it is enabled by default. There is no extra charge for using voicemail. The default voicemail pin is a four digit random numeric number. If you enter your pin number Erinus three times in succession, it will block you for a period of two minutes. This is hard coded into the PBX and cannot be changed. You can disable voicemail from being used on an extension if it's not really necessary. And you can also increase the digit length for the pin number to up to 10 characters. Now we will talk in the next slides about some of the security aspects of 3CX. We will talk example for the allowed country codes, which is under settings and security. There is the allowed country codes tab. Secure SIP using TLS certificates is possible with 3CX. This will be enabled under security and secure SIP. 
We will also talk about the configuration of secure audio, the secure RTP. We will then move on to the anti-hacking options, which is under settings and security and under the anti-hacking tab. We will then finish off with the IP blacklist, which is on the dashboard, and you will see it there, IP blacklist, which you can configure. Let's start with the allowed country codes. The allowed country codes will show you which countries the PBX is allowed to make international calls to. This is in addition to the outbound rules of the PBX. So if, for example, you do allow calls to a country, for example, to the United Kingdom, and you don't have it as an allowed country code, it will not allow the call to go through. The allowed country codes will override any settings in the outbound rules. It will use the international dialing code from the E164 settings of the PBX. In order to match the E164 rule and to basically take this into consideration, it will do the match after the outbound rule reformatting, after you have stripped the digits and prepended digits to the beginning of the number. And it must match exactly to be effective. Now, securing the communications between the extensions and the PBX will be done using Secure SIP. You will need to create certificates for TLS. You will be able to ask technical support for assistance if you do not know how to. You will then enable Secure SIP in the PBX. You will insert the certificate and key into the management console. You will copy uh, paste the string of the certificate and the key, and then you will uh, configure your desk phones manually. They will be uh, communicating using secure SIP on port 5061. If you are using a 3CX client for Windows, you will need to import the certificate into Windows. You will then go to the extensions page of the PBX, select your extension, go to the phone provisioning tab. Under the 3CX client, uh, configuration, you will choose SIP transport and choose TLS. Now the securing of the audio to and from configured extensions will be done at a desk phone manually from the user interface. If you are using a 3CX client for Windows, again, under the phone provisioning tab of the extension you wish to configure, go to the 3CX client dropdown and then choose RTP mode equals only secure. Moving on to the anti-hacking options of the PBX. From here, you can specify the amount of failed authentication attempts coming into the PBX before an IP address is blacklisted. By default, it is 25 attempts. You can further secure this by reducing the attempt number to a minimum of three. Please do not put it too low. Do not put it to one, for example, as this will also cause legitimate extensions to be blacklisted as well. On the same page on anti-hacking uh, module of the PBX, you will be able to specify the amount of unchallenged 407 authentication requests. When a request is made to the PBX, the PBX will respond with a 407 authentication request. Um, usually a bogus host trying to authenticate onto the PBX, trying to uh, penetrate the PBX, will not respond to the 407 authentication request and we'll keep sending new challenges. Uh, when this happens, basically, the PBX will keep ports open, will keep resources active uh, waiting for these and will eventually uh, hog the resources of the PBX. So we do limit this to a default of a thousand attempts. You can further secure this by reducing the attempts to a minimum of a hundred. We'll now look at the 
security barriers of the PBX. We'll start with the green security barrier, and this is the time between taking action when entering the PBX and being uh, taken account for. So by default, it is 200 milliseconds, and this is when the counting starts on the PBX, but no action is taken on a packet. Uh, you can further increase the security of the PBX by lowering the value, or you can decrease the security by increasing the value. Moving on to the AMBER security barrier, you will be able to define the maximum amount of packets per second uh, coming in from a particular IP to prevent flooding. Uh, by default, it is 2,000 packets per second. Once this threshold has been exceeded, it will blacklist an IP address for five seconds. This is to allow for basically bursts of information coming from an IP address to be temporarily blacklisted without affecting the security of the PBX. Increasing the value will lower the security. Decreasing the value will increase the security of the PBX. Again, uh, bringing it too low may cause legitimate extensions to be blacklisted. This is also dependent on, uh, for example, remote IPs, uh, remote extensions uh, trying to connect. If all they connect at the same time, it may cause them to be uh, blacklisted. So it does depend on the deployment of your network as well. Finishing off with the red security barrier, this is the final frontier, the final uh, protection of the PBX. Uh, any amount of packets exceeding this threshold will place that particular IP address into the uh, blacklist for the global blacklist interval. Again, you can uh, increase your security by lowering the value. You can lower the security by increasing the value. You can, for example, bring your amber security barrier and red close to each other. So rather than just temporarily blacklisting something, you can put it into the permanent blacklist. Now the blacklist time interval is the amount of time an IP address will be blacklisted and will not be able to communicate with the PBX. By default, it is 1,800 seconds. That is 30 minutes. You can further increase by uh, increase the security by increasing the value to a maximum of 1 billion seconds minus one, which is 11,500 days um, on average. And it is about 31, point something years. Commonly used as a value is 86,400 seconds, and that is one day, that's 24 hours, and that should give ample time for the admin to investigate any uh, attacks on the PBX. Now, continuing on with the IP blacklist, when the anti-hacking criteria have been met, the IP address will be entered into the blacklist automatically for the default uh, blacklist time interval. We have said by default it is 1,800 seconds. If you have increased it or decreased it, it will be placed into that blacklist for this amount of time. You can also manually blacklist or whitelist any IPs by adding them manually into the blacklist uh, list. Now, if you are going to be putting a single IP address that is very straightforward, However, if you are going to be adding a range of IPs, you will not be entering the range, but you will enter the network address and the subnet mask. And the PBX will then calculate the actual range of IPs that you are blacklisting. Now, when you choose your action to be deny, you are blacklisting an IP address with an expiration date. However, if you choose allow, it will be placing it into a whitelist to allow the PBX to be contacted from this IP address on a permanent basis. There is no expiration date for the whitelist. Now, there are some do's and don'ts with the IP blacklist. We do recommend that you do whitelist any trusted static IP addresses, for example, remote uh, offices. Um, if you do see any IPs with suspicious activity, we do recommend that you do blacklist them. However, don't blacklist very large IP ranges. 
it would be recommended in this particular case to use your firewall instead to prevent this traffic from even coming into the network. Again, on the topic of uh, the whitelist, going back to the whitelist, which will allow IP addresses to communicate with the PBX, don't whitelist them blindly. Make sure that you do investigate every IP address which is coming in, and this will basically allow you uh, to see which IP address is coming from where and to actually blacklist uh, or ignore some certain IPs. Now, if you have a whitelisted IP address, they are exempt from the anti-hacking options, so it is a good idea to do a very good thorough research about each IP. Now, the management console is accessible from the outside world if you have the proper port forwarding done. Now, after three failed login attempts, the PBX will blacklist the person attempting to log in uh, for the entire duration of the blacklist time interval, and the local host will be exempt. So if you are on the server, you are trying to authenticate to the management console and you don't manage to, you will be exempt, you will not be blacklisted. The security of the password will need to be complex, a complex username, complex password, and change this on a regular basis. Uh, this will basically prevent people from guessing your password and will increase the security of your PBX dramatically. Connecting to the PBX from an RPS enabled extension, a remote stun extension will be prompted for a username and password. Any requests coming in will need to have a valid MAC address a valid extension number, and a valid PIN number. They must all match, and you have three attempts to authenticate, or the PBX will place you into the blacklist. Have in mind that if you have disallowed use of the extension outside the LAN, even if you do put the correct credentials, you will be blacklisted. Moving on to expand on man-in-the-middle attacks. A 3CX certificate is issued by a trusted certifying authority. We are using Let's Encrypt. They are a trusted certifying authority. However, if you are using your own certificate, avoid using self-signed certificates and use a certificate from a trusted certifying authority. If you are having a doubt which SSL certificate to use for your own domain, have a look and see with the phone manufacturer of the phones you are using to make sure that they do support your certificate. Um, if you are going to be using a 3CX certificate which is trusted or your own which is from a trusted certifying authority, this will basically uh, alleviate any man in the middle attacks. Anyone who is using an unsigned certificate and you try to connect onto the PBX, the users will get a warning in the browser notifying them of such uh, a discrepancy. It may even be just a certificate has expired, but it is worth, if you do see an error, to investigate and see what's going on. It might be a man in the middle attack. If the phones which are supported detect an invalid security certificate, they will not download a config file. Now, closing off with some general security advice for your network and the PBX. On your firewall, you can use your access control lists to allow only trusted IP addresses into the network. Uh, we do recommend that you use the 3 6 tunnel whenever possible. For example, remote extensions, please use the SBC. Use your 3 6 clients to connect using the tunnel. You will then need to open 5060 only for the IP addresses of your providers. Make sure that you do pass the firewall test first, and then you can limit the IP address range to only your providers. You will be open to you will be able to open publicly the port 5090, which is the 3CX tunnel. This will basically allow you to connect using the tunnel, authenticate, and then authenticate with the extension credentials. All remote extensions can connect through the 3CX tunnel without any issue at all. If you have a site-to-site -site VPN, we do recommend that you use it. The traffic will not be exposed to the internet 
all the traffic will be coming over the VPN and the phones can be provisioned as local extensions. They don't need to be rec uh, provisioned as remote extensions. I do thank you for your time and watching this video about the security of 3CX. I do look forward to seeing you at another one of our videos. Join us for our webinars as well for more detailed presentations as well. I would like to thank you for joining me and goodbye.